deification. This is one of the main themes in the Dead Sea Scrolls 11Q Melchizedek. And I have some dynamite stuff for you on that also. Once again, see, I know I'm, I have a bias. Everyone has a bias. We have a, a point of view that we come from. I'm well aware of that. My bias is, of course, LDS, Mormonism. This is the culture I was raised in. It is the theology I have lived and breathed and read. I really do believe there has been a restoration. I really do believe Joseph Smith is a true prophet. I believe we have prophets and apostles in the land again today. I believe Jesus is the Christ. And I accept his atonement. I will present that to the world with pleasure. Not a problem. I don't have a problem with that. I know there's some people who almost are almost fearful to uh, share their, their religion. I'm not. But I'm not scared to look beyond my own tradition into other areas also. And I think it would do other people good to take seriously what we have to offer also. An exchange of ideas is far superior than simply being opposed. That is my underlying philosophy in everything I do, as far as that goes. We're all in this thing together. I keep saying that, too. But for Davila to say that Melchizedek himself is a tutelary deity, and this Melchizedek figure, this is the one that Abraham paid tithes to. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Abraham is associated with this Melchizedek, like this, in Genesis 14. And he comes out of nowhere. Just all of a sudden, wham, right there, bingo, there he is. You're reading about the kings on the plain and about the war and all that, and all of a sudden, boink, here comes Melchizedek. No explanation, no nothing. Well, the extra canonical materials really fill this out exquisitely. That's what makes it so fascinating. I mean, it's fascinating enough from the biblical record. I mean, you have Hebrew 7, you know, in the New Testament, and you have this Psalm 110 from the Hebrew Bible. We'll be able to analyze the Greek aspects of Melchizedek in the New Testament, and you have this Genesis 14, and that's pretty much it in the entire Bible. And yet there's a lot of fascinating information to learn about this Melchizedek guy. He's mentioned frequently in Second Temple literature. That's true. Uh, the Genesis Apocryphon, Josephus, they paraphrase the passage in Genesis, and they explicitly identify Salem with Jerusalem. That's kind of interesting. King of Salem. Melchizedek was king of Salem. And some of the, anti the antique authors say Salem was Jerusalem. So... King of Salem, or King of uh, Jerusalem, and there's some interesting scholarly discussion on that. Also, I'll get into you with. And then the pseudo Eupolemus refers to him briefly as the ruler of a city, but it doesn't make it clear, and a priest of God who gave gifts to Abraham. He's also mentioned in the Hellenistic synagogal prayers from books seven and eight of the Apostolic Constitutions, and I just read those tonight. Book seven and eight in the Apostolic Constitutions. It's in the uh, Anti Nicene Fathers. Uh, I can't remember what volume. I didn't bring it with me out here in my backyard, but I'll get to it. He is briefly mentioned. Interesting context is where he's mentioned. And then, of course, he doesn't function as a divine mediator in any of those texts. So that's one angle, that, that's one um, particular aspect of Melchizedek that we have. Okay, now... As a divine mediator up to 100 B.C., Davila says, the story of the assault of the four kings on the cities of the plain appears in the book of Jubilees. And I have some wonderful materials on Jubilees I'm going to share with you also. And Jubilees, well, Jubilees is basically a rewrite of uh, Genesis. It's another, it's another angle on Genesis. But I do believe at one time it was considered scripture by some groups of Jews. So, very interesting here. We're not talking just apocryphal. Even these terms, 
these modern terms that we've given, uh, pseudepigrapha, apocrypha, scripture, false writings, even these terms are being argued and questioned now, and I'll get into that also, because now the scholars are saying, you know what, we moderns categorize all of this writing, this, this enormous mountain and mass of writing, so that we can kind of get a handle on it, get a grip on it, but we may not be right. <laughs> Which, that should shock you. If it doesn't, you're not studying enough. It's okay, I'll bring it up to you in these videos. The idea that what we label scripture, or what we label non-canonical apocrypha, I mean, hey, the Roman Catholics canonize the apocrypha, you see. There's a different canon right there. I think they might have had the right idea, too. Believe it or not, I know, an LDS person saying that about Catholics? Yeah. Our Catholic brethren have some phenomenal qualities we need to begin recognizing. So anyway, that's enough of that. So this idea that uh, he's mentioned in the Book of Jubilees, and he is discussed in the, uh, let's see, in the Fragments in Jubilees, he says, the text gives us an idea of what the passage might have contained, which was disturbing enough to a later Christian working with the Greek translation. A passage was suppressed where Melchizedek met Abraham and had his discussion and involvement with Abraham. This uh, book of Jubilee suppressed it, and Dravila has a discussion on that that I have. The 11Q Melchizedek. He says here, the biblical figure of Melchizedek has almost been entirely swallowed up by the heavenly figure of Melchizedek in the Dead Sea Scrolls. He's an angel. <laughs> really fascinating. In fact, he's on par with the archangel Michael. And in fact, some scholars have equated these two. Melchizedek as Michael. And that's really an interesting thrust here with the, uh, with the Dead Sea Scrolls idea. He says, uh, The hero is an exalted patriarch in the strong sense, he says, almost a principal angel without any reference to an earthly origin. Is this who came to Abraham, you see? Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? He's also the future ideal figure, namely the divine warrior. Ooh, a divine warrior angel figure. Very interesting here. And he says, originally, possibly either Baal or Marduk in the ancient Near Eastern myth, or also Yahweh in the Hebrew Bible. Ooh. <laughs> Melchizedek has a direct line in conjunction with Yahweh. Potentially, possibly. And I will explore that with you also. It's very interesting. You're starting to see what's going on here? This exploration of Melchizedek, you kind of go, whoa, wow. Ooh, ee. We thought Michael was Adam. In the LDS tradition, Michael is Adam. We understand that. That's okay. Melchizedek, from the Qumran Jews, is equated with Michael. And Michael is equated with other angels also. I'll show you that. That's some wonderful stuff out of the, uh, the uh, testamentary literature of Abraham that I've got. Beautiful stuff. So anyway, and he says, the reason he says that, that this association with the divine figure, with Melchizedek, uh, has pregnant potential is because he is not explicitly a priest in these Dead Sea Scroll fragments. He's not identified as a priest. Now, he is identified as a priest in the Bible. We understand that. Priest of the Most High God, El Elyon. Very interesting. El Elyon. This was uh, uh, Melchizedek's God. Okay, I want you to just keep that in mind. The tantalizing assertion is that the lot of Melchizedek, as mentioned in this Dead Sea Scroll fragment, the 11Q Melchizedek, the lot of Melchizedek is the Day of Atonement in the 10th Jubilee, in which to atone for all the sons of El. Now, this may be referring indirectly to his function as the celestial high priest. And 